before we introduce Nicole, I also want to thank you all for being here um, tonight. As you likely know, 2018 represented a year of reckoning for us. Um, one of our donors recently referred to our path forward as uh, SBCF's renaissance period, um, which we're all really looking forward to um, as staff. Um, we believe that it's our role as your community foundation to help our local philanthropists be the best they can be. So in 2019, we are really committed to deepening our relationships with all of you, and we'd really love to hear from you about your experience working with us um, and what we can do to make your philanthropy most meaningful. So with that, please feel free to share your thoughts and your feedback with your philanthropy advisor, with me, um, with Misty Sangani, who I'll introduce in a moment, with Nicole. You can do that in person, you can do that via email. Um, and also know that we're going to be employing some formal tools to help us. So you may have noticed already that when you email directly with your advisor, there's a link at the bottom of the signature that you can click on and take a quick survey. And we hope that you'll use that and continue to use it because the questions will change over time. Um, so with that, I am delighted to introduce Misty Sangani, our Executive Vice President of Philanthropy and a perpetual force of positivity at SBCF. Um, she is the fearless leader of our philanthropic services division, which includes donor engagement, corporate responsibility, donor services, and development. Um, and she's here today not only to interview Nicole, but to share a bit about SBCF's updated institutional values and our donors' impact. Thanks, Casey, um, and thank you all. It, it is really um, such a joy to see so many old friends, new friends, um, and, and part of our extended family of donors. Um, so good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you all for coming. And as Casey mentioned, we are just so thrilled to have um, the opportunity um, and really the honor to be a part of your philanthropic journey. Um, it brings us joy and um, uh, meaning when we know that we are helping you um, in your incredible generosity in our communities. Um, so as Casey mentioned in the last year, um, our uh, community foundation, your community foundation, um, went through a values exercise. Um, we reevaluated the values um, on the staff and the board um, and how um, really they define who we are and um, define our work in the community and our work with you as um, the, our donor community. Um, we know we want to work toward meaningful change. And in order to do that, we have come up with five values of collaboration, courage, respect, accountability, and inclusion. And I'd like to share with you just a couple of examples of how our donor engagement team, our team of philanthropy advisors, work with you in making these values happen every day. So in our value of collaboration, um, I want to um, call out a, a, a wonderful family, the um, Bostrom McCormick family. Um, who would, along with their professional advisors and their philanthropy advisor, decided to establish a memorial fund in honor of their daughter, Nora, who passed away just at four years old after spending nearly a quarter of her life hospitalized. During her time at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Nora found the hospital's library to be a place of calm in this world of chaos. And in light of that, the spirit of collaboration continues as the family and their philanthropy advisor work with Valley Medical Center to honor Nora, her vibrant memory, and bring other families together who are coping with chronic illness, the joy of a children's library right there at VMC. Um, you know, in the value of courage, we have a very special project fund here called Scrubs Addressing the Firearm Epidemic. Started in our own backyard by Stanford physicians, the SAFE movement has gained national momentum by doctors, nurses, paramedics, and healthcare providers working together to end gun violence. 
and the recognition that this is a health crisis of epidemic proportion. So through research, education, and courage, they have made this evidence-based policy group and collaborate with a courageous group of funders and how they work with patients with facts and information that allow them to make the most informed decisions surrounding firearms. And finally, our, one of our values of inclusion. And I know there are some members here of the Women Go Fund, which is a committee advised fund at SVCF, focusing on small grassroots organizations that are deeply embedded in Silicon Valley communities they serve. Women Go's mission is to fund organizations in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties to obtain the education and or training they need to advance economic mobility. So from an organization's programming, they examine everything through an inclusive, comprehensive gender lens and the impact on women in San Mateo and Santa Clara. So we are so honored to work in partnership with all of you, our extended family of donors. We're still working to finalize our 2018 data, but I'm pleased to share that in 2017, your community foundation granted $254 million to charities in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, and $182 million to charities elsewhere in the Bay Area. And we are pretty sure that the 2018 numbers are going to even be higher. So for those um, who like numbers out there, I thought we would share that since the Community Foundation was established in 2006 through 2017, you all have granted almost $2.8 billion locally to our nine Bay Area counties. And for this, we are incredibly honored to be working with you. Um, just to give you some highlights coming up in 2019, um, we would like to partner and work with you for Census 2020. Um, which if you all have quite, you'll be getting materials and some learning opportunities that are going to be coming throughout the year. Um, this is a major priority for Silicon Valley Community Foundation and uh, we would love to partner with you on it. Um, but now, without further ado, um, the reason you all are here, I know, is to meet our new uh, CEO and President, um, Nicole Taylor. So hopefully you've had a moment to read a bit about her um, bio um, that's been up uh, while I've been talking. Um, as you know, she began her career as an educator in Oakland um, to leading the East Bay Community Foundation. And she worked in student affairs, community engagement and diversity at Stanford University, and most recently served as the vice president of the ASU Foundation. So please welcome our new president and CEO, Nicole Taylor. So thank you, Nicole. Thank you. We're thank you. thrilled to have you here. It's an honor to be here. It's um, an honor. I'm being told to, to move yes. my mic a little bit. Just How's a little that? bit. Is that good? Yeah. OK. Um, so as we all know, you have a stellar background. Um, but I think what a lot of us are wondering is what got you excited in the first place um, to be in this work and what has kept you in it? Yeah, so, um, and some of you have heard this because um, I've said this in other places and some of people have known me for a long time here. Um, what got me into the work of giving and giving back and giving of myself and being in nonprofits and education started from my mom. So my mom's an immigrant from Jamaica and came here with a sixth grade education and instilled in me this this passion around, um, you know, she used to tell me literally every day on the way to school in elementary school that you're going to make something of yourself. You're going to make something of yourself. She was a domestic. She came here with a wealthy Chinese Jamaican family. So I actually, when I grew up, I knew Mandarin. So <laughs> I know. So I, I know. So it was, you know, for me, that was all normal. Didn't realize in the United States, some people wouldn't think that's normal, especially now. So I, um, you know, she's the one who instilled in me that I, I had to just strive to be my best from day one, and so I didn't know anything else. Um, she also would tell me things like, to whom much is given, much is expected. Well, at that time, we were very, very poor, very poor. So I always thought that, okay, when I make a lot of money, that's what, you know, and she would say, no, 
you are blessed with so many skills. I was really good in school, you know, with, with a brain. You need to use that for good. You need to use that for good. And, and so that's what actually got me on this whole path of, you know, I was a human biology major, hated chemistry, so I had to make that fateful call. You know, when you grow up in a poor family, what do you know? You become a lawyer, you become a doctor. That's pretty much all she knew of a successful career. So I called her and said, Mom, uh, med school, I just, it, that's not in the cards. I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> it was, you know, she's like, they don't care about teachers in this country. You're not going to make enough money. It's really hard. I mean, she, and it's, that was a long time ago, and she's still, still true. I said, yeah, but, you know, I can be a science teacher, and I can do all these things, and I can get, you know, so... She, whatever, you, whatever you think is best, baby, whatever you think is best. So she was always with me. That's what got me in this work. And, and from your background, we learned that this is a homecoming for you. It is, it is. Um, and so tell us what it's been like to be back in the Bay Area, yeah, back in Yeah, it feels Valley. great. It really feels great. So, you know, I lived here most of my adult life, half of my adult life. The other half was in the East Bay. Um, I ran the East Bay Community Foundation, and so I li lived and worked in Oakland for a long time. I started teaching in Oakland. Um, but I came here when I was 17 to go to school, um, right up the road. And um, so I grew, I literally grew up here. Um, when I was at Stanford, I tutored in East Palo Alto. You know, I was, I worked in Upward Bound with kids from uh, Redwood City, Menlo Park, and East Palo Alto. So, you know, that's, that's, this is the community that I knew. Um, did my student teaching in Palo Alto, right? So this was a place that just was, home for me. And then um, when I came back to work at Stanford, I also ran a family foundation in Menlo Park, but when I came back to work at Stanford, you know, my son went to Sarah High School in San Mateo. And he did not think that Tom Brady needed a sixth <laughs> ring, by the way, even though he himself played football there. He's like, he has five. He needs to give one to the other guy. So that's just <laughs> That's how much <laughs> this is a homecoming for me, right? And I was on the board of, of Sarah High School. So this is really like just coming to a place that I care very much about. Um, and also when I came back, I was only gone for two years. And when I came back... Um, I couldn't believe how much worse the problems had gotten. You know, all those campers and RVs that were right out on El Camino, they like tripled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the homeless problem, yeah. incredibly, you know, the trying to forget buying a house. How do people like live and pay rent? Mm -hmm. You know, where are the jobs for the people who are low, lower skilled and how are we get th getting them to the point where they can have livable, sustainable wages and take care of their families? I couldn't believe that in, in that short of a time, the needs just seemed to exponentially get worse. And so coming back, I was like, absolutely, I got to be part of something where I can be leading change, where I can be part of the conversation about what is it going to take for us to have this community thrive, to have everyone who lives in here in this community thrive. So I take it that's what drew you it did. to this it leadership did. position. And now you've been here as our president and CEO for two months. Yes. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about what really drew you to Silicon Valley Community Foundation yeah. in the midst of what Casey right. you know, referred to as our reckoning. Yeah. Um, it felt like all of, first I got the phone call. So when you get the phone call, got to return the phone call, right? <laughs> so my fiancé said, I said, they called me. He's like, well, you're calling them back. <laughs> you, you know, he was great. He was like, you're perfect for this. And I'm like, I've been out of philanthropy for a while. I'm in higher ed now. And I, but the more I thought about it, you know, it's communities I care about, communities I've, you know, grown up in, ran nonprofits in, worked in. Um, and then I realized all of the different pieces of my life professionally have led me to this point. And if not me, then who, really? So that's kind of how I felt. I might as well just talk to them. Right. And I'm going to be who I am. And they, you know, if they don't like who I am, if they don't like what I'm bringing to the table, they won't, we won't have a second conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt that I could, I wanted to be able to lead this organization out of the place that it was and to bring everybody back together for why we're even here, why this place even exists, and why we're here to serve you and your philanthropic needs, why we're here to serve the communities. 
So in, in kind of our renaissance mm -hmm. period. Yes. Um, yeah, I know it's been only two months. Oh, I got it all for you. <laughs> I have a There's a slide deck that I'm about to run through with everything. It's all for you. But, but it, is, it is the question that many of us yes. have in mm -hmm. the room of um, where, do you, where do you see us right. going? So um, the big part of where I see us going is back to the roots of what a community foundation is, and staff seeing me do this. So, and I was on the Federal Reserve Board, and so this dual mandate is what the feds is, is exists for, so I feel like we also have a dual mandate as a community foundation. One is to really help the communities that are right here that we are we're formed to serve, so Silicon Valley, the two counties that were right here, as well as understanding that this valley has impacted the entire region. So what does that mean and what responsibility do we have to the region? All the great innovation and the companies and everything that came out of here have impacted everything, right? So, um, but we are here to serve, the, we need to figure out how to serve those communities and help this region be all it can be for those people, for everyone who's here. Companies, families, mm -hmm. kids, right? Then the other part of the mandate is helping our donors be the best philanthropists they can be. They come to us for a reason. They could easily go to Schwab Charitable and Vanguard Charitable and Fidelity Charitable, and any of them do. We have donors who have funds in multiple places, but they come here for a reason. I, having worked in this field for a long time, mostly think, and you can all correct me if I'm wrong, you come here because you want to be part of a community, you want to be part of something that's that's aggregating knowledge and about impact. You want to be someplace where you can get philanthropic advice. You want to be part of something where you can meet other donors who might be interested in some of the things that you're interested in. You, you come here because you're, you want to learn about the place where you live, maybe you've raised your kids, where you've started your companies, where your employees live, and you realize that it's time for you to be part of giving back. So that is what we need to be about. And then we also need to figure out how to bridge it. How do we do this? How do we bring the community to the donors and the donors to the community and do it in multiple and interesting and innovative ways for those who really want to understand more about what's going on here? Mm -hmm. some, some don't. Some are, you know, they're about, you know, their own philanthropic goals, which is great. We will help you do that. What I'm hearing from when I sit with individual people, even here, they want to know more about what's happening right here that they could be a part of, that film about the deep well drilling that's happening right off our, or about to happen right off our coasts, right here, right? So those kind of conversations I'm having that donors really want to see us in that role mm -hmm. as well. Of course the community wants it, but I'm hearing it from both sides. And, and we're definitely gonna open up to questions from, so if you all wanna start thinking about what you'd like to ask Nicole um, directly. Nicole, um, what, how would you define um, kind of your leadership style yeah. and, um, uh, you know, from your past experience and, and also, you know, where you see yourself as a leader in this community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am one who, I mean, this is part of the month, last couple months I've been listening. I need to understand and hear from the people who are right in it. Um, need to hear multiple voices multiple perspectives before I make big decisions. There are times when I, I can make a decision, so it's not that I'm about you know listening to everything and taking months and months. You know, when a decision needs to be made, I will make the decision, but I almost always make a decision based on what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, and bringing those disparate voices and the, you know, the back and forth that needs to happen, that, that is how I lead. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been out a lot listening, so I haven't been in the office as much as I intend to be, but I enjoy walking around and just talking to staff and just understanding or having them come in and say, hey, I have this idea, or, you know, as Toby and I were meeting about the art committee, so you have to make sure you see the art that staff has really put up on the walls, gotten put up on the walls, but she's like, well, now that I'm here, can we talk about this? I'm like, of course we can talk about it. I will actually want to hear your perspective and what you think about, you know, and she had some wonderful ideas, and I'm like, go, do them. You know, so uh, that that's who I am as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, I feel also, you know, you talked about being a leader in this community. I feel, and I've said it a couple of you tonight, an immense responsibility sitting in this seat. I feel not only from where we were in this past year and making sure that we, you know, 
get the ship moving forward and in a, in a good direction, but also what it means to be a woman of color in the Silicon Valley sitting in this seat and what that represents to women, what that represents to immigrant mm -hmm. communities. When people find out that I'm a daughter of an immigrant, what it means to um, people of color to be in this seat and, and to lead with integrity and authenticity um, and how do we leverage who we are to affect all the issues that we see right in front of us. So mm -hmm. um, I think about that deeply every day. Right. And that, that, that's the lens at which I show up every day. So in, in my introduction, I started with um, the values, mm -hmm. the five values that Silicon Valley Community Foundation are, you know, both internal and external. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see those values kind of wrapping into your daily life yeah. here at the foundation, working with our community, mm -hmm. working with our donors, working with the staff? Um, that is, you know, part of the reckoning right. that we were talking right. about. Well, I was really excited the values work happened during the, the interim. Great, Avis was here and did a phenomenal job as interim CEO. Really glad he was here for that period of time. Um, and I saw what they were. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is everything that aligns with who I am as a person and what I've done in the la other other organizations that I've I've led. You know, so just even the collaboration. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to lead a community foundation without collaborating with other partners on any issue. I, there's no way on any complex issue that we're facing that any one player can do it alone. Mm -hmm. So when I saw it, I was like, fantastic. Courage is one, which mm -hmm. as a value most people don't put courage on you know, the poster of what's a value. Um, given where we are, given the times we're facing, given the d deep division in our country, given the political battles that, we're, we're, that are being fought, given just the struggle for living a life where you can feed your kids, all of that, that's going to take some courage as an organization. And that's going to take you know, our courage externally, but also internally for our staff to really start thinking about mm -hmm. what does it mean to be part of an organization that has this kind of responsibility in front of it? What does it mean to know that we are here for a bigger pur purpose? Mm -hmm. And how am I going to step up? You know, I'm telling them, you are, step up. You are empowered to step up. What does that mean? And are you really going to take the leap in terms of bringing ideas to the forefront and really trying things differently and in new ways? Right. So right. there's just two examples. Yeah. Um, so, Nicole, what's kind of been your biggest surprise um, coming back? Coming back? Yeah. Well, I talked about one earlier, just, you know, and you, I know you all know that the issues are bad. When you step away from it and come back, you know, it's like the, the frog in the water metaphor. Um, you, you know, it's a while before the frog realizes it's in boiling water, right? <laughs> when I stepped back and came back, it was like, oh, right here, and it's palpable. So that was one surprise. Um, the and internal, in these last two months. Yeah, yeah in the last two months, um, the amazing strength, resiliency, and energy that the staff has. We've been through a lot. And they are ready to move forward and go. They, um, they, you know, it was a hard time for all of you and very public, everything that happened last year. And through it all, they were about the work. They were about helping you. They were about getting money into the community. Um, they were about making sure that the train, <laughs> the trains ran on time and they didn't skip a beat. Um, the, the, they're still here and wanting to serve. And I, so it's not, it's, it's wonderful. I hate to call it a surprise, mm -hmm. but um, it's, that has been, I think, that, that energizes me every day as well. That, that's terrific. I mean, oh. uh, you know, I, I would just add to that, that to see a full room like this of our extended donor mm -hmm. family and the support really that you all gave us, um, I think it was incredible yes. during that time, no. and um, yeah. and I'm sure you feel that energy for you yeah. now. Yes. Um, yes, has been wonderful. Um, so before I open it up, mm -hmm. what would you like this room to know about you? Um, that I'm here, <laughs> and I'm present, and I'm here to listen, and um, you know I'm here to help, and you know the team is here, but about me that I'm I'm. I'm here, mm -hmm. you know, I'm fully present and fully here and here to work with you and help you, you know, be the best philanthropist you can be. 
I think that's, that's what I definitely want you to know. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I do want to give a, a nice um, a bit of time for anyone who has any questions, um, and we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So Nicole, yes. you men mentioned that you got the call. Mm -hmm. So given all of the potential candidates mm -hmm. for the position mm -hmm. you have, mm -hmm. how do you think your name came up on the list? You know, I've been wondering that. Um, so I, I figured it was from one or two or however many, I don't know, people who knew of my prior work. They knew of my work at East Bay Community Foundation. They knew of my work here locally when I was at Stanford. They knew, um, you know, because I ran the Haas Center for a bit. Um, so, I, you know, my sense is people knew the kind of leader I was in different, you know, different parts of my career and thought that it might be a good idea for me to be in the mix. So that's the only thing I can think of because I've, I've been in higher ed, for, you know, I was in higher ed for over four years um, before this. Um, and so I thought I was like, not even on anybody's radar. So, and I was in another state. So um, that's the only thing I can think of is that somebody, someone or a couple people thought, you know, she has some of the skills that that you at least need to have a conversation with her. So, I don't, you need to ask a board member that. <laughs> I have no idea how they got my name. I, I mean, I don't know. Hi. Hello again. Uh, my name is Mike Piscotti. My, uh, my son, Stephen, and I, Stephen plays for the Oakland Athletics. Mm -hmm. uh, and went to Stanford. And went to Stanford. <laughs> go Cardinals. Yeah. And Cardinal. Yes. No, we can, you can say go card. It's okay. Anyway, uh, uh, following the passing of my wife, Gretchen, mm -hmm. from ALS, in May of this year, we created a uh, foundation called ALS Cure. Mm -hmm. um, we had some great advice from Major League Baseball um, to say, don't create your own 5013C, yeah. Mike, uh, organized as a special project yes. under the foundation, and yes. it's really been the best advice oh, I've great. received. My question to you is, mm -hmm. how can you help maybe our organization mm -hmm. and other special projects right. um, reach out to this fine yeah. donor community? Yeah. Thought about yeah, I, ha I have thought about that because we did it a lot in, in East Bay. Uh, we had a small endowment in the East Bay, so, which meant we had very limited grant dollars to, that we had discretion over. And in a variety of ways, we would raise issues and have events and conversations and send out information on a variety of issues, not just the issues that we chose to focus on with our grant making and our policy work, but other issues that we thought may be of interest to donors, you know, especially donors who might have given to research in that area or, you know, so we kind of start with low hanging fruit, who's been interested in this and here's, you know, here's a special project that is at the foundation, would you be interested in hearing more about it? We're gonna have a guest speaker or a researcher or something on it, um, you know, and, and that tended to work, right? If we're smart about who we're reaching out to about an issue based on what you've been giving to and based on conversations you've had with our staff, um, chances are you might be interested. I met with a donor who couldn't be here today, and he said, if you do anything about how much I should be leaving to my kids and my grandkids, I will be there, and I have a feeling several other of your donors might be in the same boat that I am, right? So again, it's like listening to where, where you all are, what you care about, and then, you know, hey, we have this thing, are you interested? You may or may not be, but that's, that tended to work. When, you know, when we're not throwing everything at you, we're not telling you about everything, um, because, you know, we, we're trying to be smart. We, we know you're all busy people, so we, you know, trying to be smart at, at that. So, yes. Uh, sure. Okay, I can give you a okay. Sure. Uh, Nicole, it's, yes. it's, it's a pleasure and honor to be oh. with you here today. You. It's, it's such a, with my wife next to me, especially, right? So it's so much fun. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in my line of work, I'm very, very uh, focused and passionate and mm -hmm. compassionate about producing next generation leaders. Yes. Starting with teens, right? Mm -hmm. And even with my older daughter, she's very fortunate to and lucky to be uh, an, an, an engineer mm -hmm. back in Google headquarters. Right. After graduating college last year, right. I said, honey, start early. Become a philanthropist, uh, right? right? It's so easy to right. go through S S B C F, yeah. right? And start your own donor advice fund. Yes. Right? Then, then be a philanthropist early. Yes. 
So Great. my question to you yes. is any strategy, any plans to help get the, uh, the get next the generation? Started? Yeah. Get yeah. Early. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things Absolutely. that, yeah, that's one yeah. of the things that we've already started talking yeah. about is, yeah. is, um, bringing back to life mm -hmm. some, this work. We talked about it today, actually. We did. <laughs> Just today, just bringing just back to life. Some of the work that the foundation has done before, so mm -hmm. it's not completely reinventing the wheel, but how do we work with families? How do we engage them? Just like that donor asked me, how do we engage them in terms of thinking about the next generation and bringing them in? They, they will have very different conversations than you sitting here in this room, <laughs> right? And just as you know, um, when you think about your kids and your grandkids, you know, they, they look at the world um, through different lenses and have different ideas about what they'd like to do. So we would tail, whatever we do, we'd be tailoring it appropriately to that generation. Mm -hmm. You know, when I took this job, they're like, there's a lot of millennials on staff. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Remember I worked in higher ed. I'm like, the millennials, <laughs> we have to get ready for Gen Z. They're the ones who are just graduating, right? Yeah. And, they, and, and, and so, so that's some of what I bring here too, is really how do we think about the next generations and, um, and how do you work with them and how do you get them excited about it? And how do you connect them? And it may be a little disconnected to what mom and grandma <laughs> want to do, but getting them into the habit of giving. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. Was, yeah. Hi, Nicole. My name is Tony Steve. I'm just thrilled that you've taken on this role. Oh, thank thank you. you. So, my question is mm -hmm. um, about uh, the folks, the geographical folks of the yes. Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I really love the fact that you talked about homelessness in this area yes. and your problems that you see. Yes. And and I think you have a big focus on looking at issues in this area. Yes. Um, where would you see the balance geographically between uh, San Francisco Bay Area region, mm -hmm. national USA, mm -hmm. and worldwide? Right. So we are absolutely focused locally. We have to be our grant making, what we do, and how we lead is here locally in these two counties. And like I said earlier, because of our influence in the region, we can play a leadership role in the re region. Saying that, we also help the donors do what they want to do and do how they want to carry out their philanthropy. So if you want to give wherever you want to give, we help you do that. Um, but given what's going on here, I'm not going to be able to be a leader, you know, and fly out and be in Europe to, to talk about what needs to be, you know, what may, may need to happen on the world stage. I have colleagues who run private foundations who have that flexibility. Um, but our time and attention for, is here and, remember this hand? Helping you be the best philanthropist you can be. So we're, wherever you want to give, we want, I want to make sure that our staff is equipped to help you do that. Perfect answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, sort of following up on a short conversation yes. we had earlier. Yes. We talk about, well, we've got all these assets. Isn't mm -hmm. it wonderful? And my feeling is it's not measuring the number of assets you've got, yes. but it is where have you deployed the assets. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's wonderful. Look at this beautiful bank account. It's wonderful. Well, it's not helping the community. Now, I've got a little donor advice fund, and my goal is in five years from now, it will be zero. Put mm -hmm. it out in the community. Yeah. And if the foundation said, okay, we could put a billion or two billion a year into the community, yes. great, in five, ten years, we'll be down to zero. Now, people will contribute, obviously, right. to keep it up. Right. But I would like to see assets decreasing because you're pushing in the community. Yes, yes. And this is an interesting philosophy. What, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so we talked about this <laughs> while I was getting a bite to eat, and... I don't talk about our assets for that very reason. It's kind of like, so? What are we doing with them? What are we doing with the assets we, we have discretion over? What are our donors doing with the funds that they've placed with us? We need to be talking about the impact because that's actually where it matters, right? That really is where it matters. So um, that, is, that is what we're talking about at, at, in the staff, at, at the staff level. And we do, I mean, I'm hoping you find great joy about giving while you're living. Right, and so that's what we also want to be here for. Help you give while you're here, and we'll help you figure out how to the, to help with your next generation and the generation after that. But that's 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 why I think we're here, and that's why I, th I hope you're in the room, is so you can figure out, you know, how do you do that? How can you get more? I mean, there's so much need. How do you help you know meet that? And how can we be helpful in terms of thinking strategically about where how to get your balance to zero? Because I think in five years you'll do that and you're going to give more because of how great you feel about what you've done. 20% a year, that's the goal. That's good. Uh, hi, Nicole. Hi. Glad to have you here. Um, actually, it's kind of related to uh -huh. his question, but maybe, yeah. um, and it's not to be a negative issue, but 
uh, there has been press about oh, sort yeah. of that issue about mm -hmm. um, people putting money into donor yes. advised funds and not actually yes. spreading it. Do you have any thoughts, kind of like yeah. you know, reaching out to the young donors, also the inactive donors, yeah. or do you think there needs to be any response by the foundation is one of the biggest yes. ones to the national press. Yes, and we just talked about that mm -hmm. tonight, too. <laughs> because I get a lot. So I do, as you imagine, as the new person, I've been doing a lot of media interviews. So every interview, they've asked me this question. And it's actually a really good question. I think as a field, community foundations haven't, we've done us, ourselves a disservice because we actually haven't talked about how much the donors are giving out of their donor advised funds. What I'm getting in the 2018 numbers, but in the past, the average donor advice fund gives out anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of their fund every year. Is that right, so, yeah. Paul? Something like that. Mm -hmm. So we're I've, I've just asked him for 2018 numbers. Um, so we're actually giving out more. Or their donors are giving out more than it had. You, they set up private foundations where there's a five percent payout, and most private foundations don't go beyond that. They see it more as a ceiling than the floor. Um, so we haven't actually told that story. So yes, part of me knows that, not part of me, I know I need to be part of telling that story um, and ensuring that people know that our donors are actually doing that. The other thing that I, we haven't done here and others, is, but especially here, um, the average donor advice fund size is around $100,000. Most people, because we're in Silicon Valley, think that all of our donors have the billions and the hundreds of millions, but when actually most of our donors are, you know, have $100,000 or less in their donor advice funds and they're giving 80, up to 80% a year, some donors, and they're replenishing it every year. That story hasn't been told. And then we have a process by which we look at our dorm, what we call our dormant funds mm -hmm. every year. So see, so I just asked for that too. Right. Who hasn't given out in 2018? And then who hasn't given out in 2018 and 2017? And then we have mechanisms, not just to, not to outreach, but if you haven't given after a few years, right. well, we will, we will give it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that usually gets people's attention. Oh, and if it doesn't, that means they're just kind of done with their giving and it, we will put it to good use in the local community. So, so that is the story we need to tell. Um, I do think at some regulation is going to come at some point because we haven't told those stories. And... Um, so we're trying to figure out how to get ahead of it. So, yeah. You on that? Oh, whoops. Uh, Jan Half. I am a retired nonprofit director of a STEM mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, and math nonprofit. I'm also I also have an individual fund here. So I've kind of been involved from both perspectives mm -hmm. and. In my role as a nonprofit director for a dozen years, many of us felt in San Mateo, Santa Clara County that we didn't often have the opportunity to let donors know that we existed. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as an individual donor, I've heard from other individuals say, you know, we really are interested in giving to the local community, but we really don't know about the nonprofits here in Silicon Valley. So, Nicole, yes. what what is your plan yes. for helping, helping right. those communication right. channels? So I could turn to Misty and Erica <laughs> because just about every week I'm like, okay, yeah. we've got to do this. We know the nonprofits want it, but I've been hearing just like you, the donors want it too. But they don't know where to give, and they want to make sure that they're giving to high impact, high results, high outcomes, you know, well-run nonprofits here. We have got to figure out how to get that information, and not just in one way, in multiple ways. We've been talking about doing pitch days, because this valley actually knows what pitch day means, right? We, ca we called it something different in the East Bay. Here are pitch days. How do we bring in nonprofits to, you know, and we can do it thematically. One day it can be arts organizations, right? And they have their chance to pitch who they are, what their needs are, and we invite the donors who are interested in the arts to listen and hear and engage with those folks. I mean, that's just one idea. There's many, and then I've... Um, Toby had one too. She's like, it's like speed dating. We need to do something like speed dating, right? Something where we can get this information out, right? We just talked about that today. So my charge to the staff is I just gave you one idea and it worked for us in the East Bay. So that's one. Now we need like 15 more ideas about how to do this because people want to be approached different ways. So we have to make sure that we're approaching donors in multiple ways because some people want, want it in different ways. Some people just, just send me an email. Or some people, like, we've got to figure out how to put, a, put things on our website. We've got to, you know, like, so 
we're working on multiple ways to do that. And every week I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just got to get something started. And, you know, in the spirit of being in Silicon Valley, like we just try it and then we pivot if it's not working and then we pivot again and then we try something new and then, you know, so that's the plan. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole, I want to join others in saying oh. how happy, happy we are that you are here. We are just delighted. Thank you. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I've been around this community foundation biz for a while. Mm -hmm. I was on the board of the predecessor of Silicon Valley. And um, I pay attention. I talk to people and so on. I think you've done an excellent job this evening in talking about the elephant in the room. And that is the donors in this room are yearning to take ownership of the community foundation. Mm -hmm. Wherever I move around in the two counties, they keep asking, how come we're getting less money than we used to? Mm -hmm. So I checked with the staff, and the staff said, you know, that's not actually true. But what the donors and what the communities have been hearing is about the asset size. Right. Yeah. So I hope very much that you will um, confront that yes. directly yes. and do something about it. Yes. Your comments about uh, responding to the two communities two counties and so on. That's music to the ears of the people in the room. <laughs> and so I think I hope that you'd find a way uh, to balance your attention and yes. passion for that with the other um, yes. dreams of the, and plans of the Thank community you. foundation. Thank you so much, Hugh. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, to the point where we're not putting out a press release of how much money we brought in. Right? I said, I'll put a press release out on what our donors have done and the impact from some of their gifts, or the impact on what we've done. But otherwise, you know, let's get about the work. Well, I also join yes. in everybody oh, welcoming you. you as a former colleague. Um, so I just wanted to um, see if you would also talk mm -hmm. about the community grant making yes. side mm -hmm. of the foundation yep. as well, in addition to the donor advice fund. Yes. I think that over the years, um, they're, they're felt in the community from those of us who worked in nonprofits mm -hmm. to feel that the foundation really started focusing more on research driven giving mm -hmm. and kind of falling into certain categories mm -hmm. of very specific types of, of giving, right. and less around capacity building or kind of um, more responsive giving. So I was right. just wondering if there are changes as well yeah. that are planned for some yeah. of the community grant. Yeah, so we have, um, you know. Oof eight to nine million that we give out a year that we have discretion over. Unfortunately, that number hasn't changed in a decade or so. So, um, and which is the problem of when people hear our assets rise, but your grant making has stayed here, it causes this cognitive dissonance. And so, um, you know, so with the grant making that we have discretion over, we had to focus it because it's eight, eight to nine million a year. And it's on things that seem at, that there was an 18 month process of listening in terms of figuring out what the community needed. There were community organizations and nonprofit leaders and civic leaders and that came came to the table that we listened to and came up with five areas, immigration, economic uh, stability. And I'm going to remember this. Immig yeah, immigration, education, economic stability, housing and transportation, and civic participation. So that's that's where we're focusing, and we're sending we're issuing RFPs and that kind of thing for that. We also, as part of this, how do we get donors connected to the community and vice versa? Looking at how do we provide better resources and services to the nonprofits. So what does it mean to you know? be more responsive in terms of needs that come up. How do we think about um, nonprofit sustainability issues and organizational development issues that they may have and how can we play a role in that as part of our duty as a community foundation to the nonprofit community. So those are some of the things that we've been talking about since I've been here that we've got to figure this piece out because 
because our own grant making is so limited, we've got to figure out other ways in terms of being responsive to the, the organizations in the two counties. We've talked about how do we partner further with the Thrive Network, which is the network of nonprofits in San Mateo County, as well as the um, Santa Clara County non nonprofit network. And how do we partner with folks like um, SB2? that's doing um, quite a bit of work with educating donors, but also thinking about how they partner with nonprofits. Um, I was, you know, so that's the, you know, Northern California grant makers I just met with the head today and, you know, how they're, they want to get more embedded in down here and helping the nonprofit community here. And they're like, we can't do that without you all and in your knowledge. And so that's the kind of thing that we're Though those are the kind of things that we're talking about doing. Can I ask a clarification? So in terms of I'm sorry. So in terms of growing the community fund and the connection mm -hmm. between the donor advised funds, yeah. is there any plans to kind of visit that? But part? yeah, so there's in terms a, there, of the yes, I have, to I, that? Oh yes. <laughs> yes, I'm like, this has been flat for how long? Um, absolutely. Okay. So we're thinking about what does it mean to grow our endowment's been flat since the merger. So really thinking about, okay. How do we grow our endowment? Because that's, as any of you know, that's what leads to the grant making and it leads to the, just the op keeping the lights on, the operations of this place, right? So really thinking, okay, what does that mean? What is that gonna mean? We haven't really done endowment grant making, I mean, fundraising. Okay. What does that really look like? Should we do that? Should we be more creative in, in really having a robust community fund that people give to? Should, you know, so we're, we're uh, um, going to launch with the board a uh, business model task force to really look at how we're structured and all of these kind of questions. Um, you know, this, this, this moment in time only happens once, so we're taking full advantage of it. Give, what, give while you live, that is a beautiful tag. <laughs> how about if we rate the donor advised funds, you know, it's gold if you've gone 30% of your assets, <laughs> silver, that's 20%. That's a rating and publishing, and anybody who's right. fifty percent, they right. get a you know silver cross or something. Right, right. But that's really what the goal is: to get the right. money out of the bank accounts right. and into the community. Well, and and some of the we think legislation that's coming out is about the transparency and reporting of what's happening with the deaths. So we're like, well, we need to talk. We can and should be talking about that. So, so we have time for about one or two one more, more questions. Here. Hello, Nicole. Hello. Nice to meet you nice tonight. To meet you. Um, are you familiar with the Giving Code? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes. Well, <laughs> one of the things when I they came and met, we met with them a few weeks ago, um, and I was like, so we need to be right at the heart of this. So that's where we are. I'm trying to figure out, and I'm going to be calling Car Carol Larson um, because you know they're they're housed at Packard right now to talk about how we be, how we get into the heart of the Giving Code. And for those of you who don't know, there was you know a survey a research done on you know who gives, where they give, what giving looks like now versus what it used to look like, and what the needs are in the community, and how do we actually get more people to think about giving locally, given the you know the tremendous wealth that exists in our two counties. And so as a result of that, um, a, a, an effort was created to, to really try to galvanize this. Um, how do we really think about getting more people to give locally? And it's, as they were talking, I'm like, we need to be at the heart of this. So, Thank you for your answer because yeah. I, it was so puzzling to me as to why the Community Foundation wasn't the leader of that yeah. conversation. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yes. One final, shall we end with Henrietta, where we began? How's that? Here we go. Here, here. <laughs> Nicole, thank you. There were some internal problems mm -hmm. that had been cited mm -hmm. um, that affected the morale mm -hmm. of the staff. Yeah. And so I'd like to know some of the steps you're mm -hmm. taking to address some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And also it was mentioned about the electronic system that was used in the foundation, that it's outdated. Mm -hmm. So what's going on yeah. with that? So one of the things I mentioned earlier, the Greg Avis was here as interim CEO, and I am very thankful that he was because a lot of what he focused on was the culture and the morale of the staff and really addressing that and having them 
I, you know, I'm speaking for staff who are in the room, feel like they, they had a voice in this organization. They created a culture task force, which had people from across the organization, not just leadership, but from across the or organization, really step up and look at everything from the values. So there's a values task force to things like, um, you know, how do we really think about um, some of the behaviors and norms that were? How do we change them to something that they're that are much more healthy and will allow staff to be effective, productive, and just proud to be part of this organization. Um, so a lot of that work was done in that interim eight to nine months. And so uh, me coming in, I'm building on that work. I'm building, see, one of the co-chairs of the, the Culture Task Force in the back, so Waco. So the, you know, I'm building on that great work that was done, and we're talking about, okay, now how do we evolve this now that we're out of this transition period? What does that really mean looking forward? And I'm, I'm asking them. You know, I'm not telling them what needs to happen. You know, I'm asking them to really think through what, what does that mean for staff to really move through this? Again, listening to their voices. Um, so that work is con continuing to happen. The board um, have created an implementation task force after the, the report came out, the investigation report, and that included senior staff and board members and literally went point by point through everything and addressed um, issues that could be addressed quickly. They have, they realized some of it needed to, they needed to wait for a CEO to make some, some of the more permanent, long lasting changes. So I'm starting to work on some of those. Technology is a huge issue for us. And um, they, the staff has done an internal assessment. What I'm working on now is with some of our friends in the technology industry um, to really come in and get an assessment from an engineering perspective and really what kind of systems do we need to have in place um, that you all deserve, that the community deserves, to, um, so that we're uh, sort of operating that way. So that is top of mind. And today with the senior team, we did a, what's, what, what are the next four months look like? Right? So we have to do strategic planning. We have to do all of this stuff. That's long-term stuff. What do we need to be, what's top of mind for the next four months? And if that was on the list, among some other things. The donor community connection, that was on the list too. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. And, and you know, that's going to take time to, to actually get to a system we're using and something that's working. So that's, that's what we're, we're, we're in it. I'm in it. I'm in it. She's in it. I am. <laughs> Believe us. I'm in it. Exactly. Um, so I, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are going to be around to mingle. Mm -hmm. um, if you have other questions for Nicole, please do so. Um, I firstly uh, want to thank you all mm -hmm. for coming and spending a couple hours on a weeknight um, to meet our new CEO and to share your thoughts. Um, and I'd really like to thank um, the staff who have helped put mm -hmm. this together. Um, Alex, who's been running around today <laughs> um, with the mic, she's done an incredible amount of work um, on, on getting you all here. Um, Amelia, who's in the back, likewise has um, made sure that your names have been spelled correctly, <laughs> the room was done well, um, and Toby Becerra, who's um, right there that many of you know, um, is not only a senior philanthropy advisor, but make sure that we have a consistent elegance of our events. Um, <laughs> so um, thank you all. And many of your philanthropy advisors are in the room. Um, Andy is right there. Um, Casey, many of you know. Sawako, Linda, Dennis. Um, am I missing anyone? Lisa Barr, many of you know, is part of the development staff, has been with us for many years. Um, and Robert, Evelyn, who's with Scholarship. So I'm pointing them out, so if you all have any questions um, or clarifications you'd like or um, next steps, um, please reach out. Um, we are here for you, and we're so thankful you're here for us. And I'm going to give Nicole the last one. Oh, word. it's just thank you. Really, it's just thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for um, being generous with your time and your resources and for um, trusting us. So thank you.